Welcome back, everyone. For today's video, we are going to be taking a look at the 10th round of the FIDE Canada's chess tournament being held here in Toronto, Canada. Now, yesterday, I suffered a very difficult defeat against Vidit Santos Gujarati from India that put me back on an even score. But today, I have white against the perceived weakest player in the field, Nijat Abbasov from Azerbaijan. Now, Nijat won on a massive Cinderella run in the FIDE World Cup back in Baku, Azerbaijan. I believe it was in September or August, September of last year to qualify for this tournament. So, Abbasov has been having a tough event, but he has gotten some draws in recent games against Fabiano Caruana and Jan Pomashi. But today, I have to go all in to try and catch up to the leaders. So, without further ado, let's jump right into the action. So, the game starts with E4. We get E5. I'm leaving the arrows back on you guys, as always, because I have seen more positive comments than negative ones. Knight F3, Knight F6, I take. We get D6, Knight F3, Knight E4, D3, Knight F6, D4, D5. All very standard so far, by the way. Nijat did play this against Jan and Pomanchi early in the event. This is what is known as the Exchange Petrov variation. And now I play the move C3. Now, in the, earlier in the event, Jan and Pomanchi castled against Nijat. And after C4, Bishop to E2, Bishop D6, Abbasov played a very, very convincing game to hold the tournament leader Jan and Pomanchi to a draw, which has played a huge role in helping some of the other players catch up. So, I play c3, c4, bishop c2. This is why you put the pawn on c3, by the way, so that you can retreat this bishop and keep it on the super long diagonal. After bishop c2, game continues with bishop d6, castles, castles, and now I play the move h3. We get knight to c6, and now I go bishop g5. Now, the reason that I played h3 here is I want to stop black from putting this bishop on g4 and pinning my knight to my queen. So, it stops bishop to g4. So now we get knight to c6, and here I play bishop g5. Now, one of the things that's really critical about this position for black is black has a tough decision to make. Does he play the mirror mirror on the wall who's the fairest of them all with h6 to stop me from going bishop g5 and pinning his knight? Or does he play knight c6? Now, the problem is black has to decide between one of these two ideas. So if you go h6 here, now white can go knight to e5. And after knight c6 and f4, white gets this massive grip on the center here with the pawns and the horse in in the center of the board on e5 and it's very reminiscent of the london system or a stone wall opening so nijat decides to play knight c6 here he decides to take away the idea of knight to e5 but now i go bishop to g5 pinning the tail on the donkey after bishop g5 we get h6 i play bishop h4 and now he plays this move b5 now it's very clear to me that abasov was sort of playing this by feel he hadn't looked at this line very recently and to be honest neither had i after all the negative comments that you guys posted on my video yesterday, I frankly did not look at any chess this morning because I was so disgusted by it all. With all my hard work that I do for you guys with these recaps, win or lose, rise or shine, and to see so many people really just being horrible in the comment section, I actually did almost no preparation. I want to give a big shout out to my wife because if it were not for my wife, I'm not so sure that I would have been able to mentally recover from it. But she was very, very positive, just telling me to forget about all you haters who are watching this video right now and just keep moving forward. So, back to the game. After b5 is played by Abbasov, I go rook to e1. We get this move a5. I play knight e5, and now he goes rook a6. Now, it was very clear to me that Abbasov had looked at a similar position to this because this idea of a5 and rook a6 is definitely non-standard here. Black wants to try and defend on the sixth rank with this rook, and this is an idea that I actually am a big fan of. So I go knight to d2, we get bishop c7, and now I play queen to f3. Now, one big issue here, now I spoke about this in my video yesterday as well, but even today, is that I have this glorious position out of the opening. I'm pinning the knight on f6, I have this jumbo horse, as well as the classic connect 5 in the center of the board, but I have so many ideas here that make sense. I can go f4 to overprotect the horse, I can go queen to f3 to pressure the knight, I can even go knight f1 with ideas like knight to e3 as well. And there simply are so many different ways to play the position that I got stuck here, and I started thinking for a long time before playing the move queen f3. Now here I spent, again, 28 minutes, which is simply way too much time on a single move. And it does come back to haunt me a little bit later in the game. So Abbasov plays knight to e7 here. Now, of course, the point is revealed that the rook laterally guards the horse on f6 from being captured. And now I go b3. Here, Abbasov plays a4, which is a very nice move here. Probably the best move, because if black plays a move like, let's just say, rook e8, for example, I have a4 to really undermine his pawn structure here on the queen side, and black has some serious issues. So Abbasov goes a4, I trade, and now I play a very logical move, which is knight, or not this move, but the next move, which is knight to f1. Now, one thing that was very strange about this game is these last couple of moves, Abbasov started moving really, really quickly. He played bishop c7 quickly, he played knight e7 in a minute, and now he played a4 really fast too, and then he plays this move a3 really quickly as well. Now, these moves came as a surprise to me. What made me start to wonder was, 
had we actually transposed back into Abbasov's preparation, was the position that by, by some virtue of the move order, he had actually looked at in the past. So A3 is a very logical move here because it takes away the pawn from being targeted on the square, but now I play the move rook b1. Now again, I want to use this open b file for my rook. I also want to try and put pressure on this pawn or the pawns on d5 and c4 if necessary. Abbasov goes rook e6 very quickly, by the way, after a little over a one and a half minute thing. And already here, I was kind of confused by what's going on. So here I play the move knight g4. And at this point, I was feeling really, really groovy about myself or my position. Now, the reason I was feeling so good here is that one of my big concerns in a lot of these positions was at some point black can play a move like knight to e4. Actually, let's just say g5, for example, and a move like knight to e4, where if I take and then I take back, there's bishop f5, which hits the queen or even something like f5 followed by an f4 maneuver with bishop f5 coming as well. And I was very, very unsure about the resulting positions. So in this position, as we keep going back, after knight to g4, I felt very good because here knight to e4 is simply not an option because after we trade everything off on e4, if black goes f5 to fork the queen and the knight here, I can simply take the horse on e7 and I'm winning the game. And if black plays this move bishop f5, which looks very scary because you're hitting the queen and the rook in, 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 in a sequence, I can simply sack the queen temporarily and after takes, 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 and knight to e3, white has an extra pawn here. The pawn on c4 is very weak and white should be close to winning. So after knight g4, Abbasov trades the knights, I take back, and now I'm feeling really good for a couple of reasons. I can put the knight in the center, pressure these pawns on d5 and c4. I have the rooks on the two open lanes. I have the bishops on optimal diagonals as well. And I already here felt like I was well on my way to a nice, simple, easy victory. So Abbasov plays queen e8 here, and I decide to play bishop g3. Now, this was a move that was based on a couple of reasons. First of all, time is starting to take away a little bit. Now, time pressure is not an issue yet, but we're only on move 23. And with 17 moves to make in 50 minutes, if one thing goes wrong, you spend 20 moves on a, or 20 minutes on a single move, it could start to get out of control. So I play bishop g3 very quickly. The reason is simple. I'm hoping to trade off these dark square b's and then down the road, put the knight on e3 to pressure these pawns. And I still control this open b file with my rook on b1. So here, Abbasov plays bishop a5, and now I trade the rooks. He takes back, and I go rook b7. Now, it's worth pointing out that, once again, Abbasov started playing moves that I was not expecting. This bishop a5 move really took me by surprise, as I thought he would simply trade off the beats. So I trade, he takes back the bishop, and now I play this move rook b7. Now, the computer actually likes rook b8 more, but I simply wasn't sure what was happening if black sacks the queen and tries to enter with rook to b2. Now, the computer, of course, thinks that this is quite good for white, but the thing is, with a rook and a bishop and very obvious plans to target the pawns on c3 and a2 here, it feels like the play is easier for black, and I simply wanted to go for a positional bind or try to win the game positionally. So, we trade the rooks, and now I play this move rook to b7, Abbasov plays knight c8, and this is where I start to lose control. Now, the reason I start to lose control here is I spent nearly 20 minutes on this rook b7 move, because I was calculating this move knight c6, which, by the way, is the best move in the position, and after bishop d6, queen c8, I simply wasn't sure how much better I am after takes, takes, bishop to a3, and now move like knight a7 and knight to b5. Now, computer gives white an advantage here, but I wasn't so convinced, so I spent a lot of time. I spent nearly 20 minutes trying to figure out what was happening in this position, and then Abbasov plays this move knight c8 relatively quickly, and I'm starting to get nervous because now I spent 20 minutes. I'm down to 26 minutes for 14 moves, and I don't have an obvious plan. So here I play the move bishop to f4, which is simply a mistake. What I should have done was gone for the memes or the content, as we like to say. Now, what I mean by that is I should have played g5 here with the idea that if black takes, there's queen h5 going for the checkmate on the diagonal. If you go g6, uh-oh, spaghetti, I sack the bishop and mate with the queen and the rook with the classic double stack on the seventh rank. And if black plays a move like f5 again, I can sack the rook. And after takes, check, king g8, check, king f7, queen g7, this is also simply checkmate. But the reason I didn't go for this is that after g5, I thought black could play queen c6, hitting the rook on b7 first. And after rook b8 and bishop c7, I thought he's attacking the rook, and I just wasn't sure what's going on. Now, the computer actually says that I should sack the rook by taking the pawn, taking this one to target his rook. And after takes and bishop b8 with the two b's and the very, very weak king on g7, apparently white is much better, if not outright winning. Now, again, I had spent so much time here on the move rook b7 that it was very hard to suddenly want to go into another 10, 15 minute thing because then I'm going to be down to five, 10, 10 minutes or five minutes and it's going to be very, very hard to be accurate. So I ended up playing this move bishop f4 after a seven minute think. And the reason I played this move is that initially in this position, 
I thought that maybe I should have gone bishop f4 with the idea of bishop c1 to pressure the pawn in a3 or to play for g5 as well. So in this position, I now I'm a little bit hasty with bishop f4. We get queen c6, and now I go rook b8, knight e7, and here I play this move rook b1, which is simply a mistake. Now again, I'm getting low on time. I have 19 minutes left for about 11 moves. Position's actually getting a little bit tricky because the bishop on a5 is pressuring the pawn on c3, bishop on e6 pressuring the pawn on g4, and I don't have an obvious attacking plan. Now, what the computer actually wants when you let it think is to go for this very nice move, bishop h7, sacking a bishop temporarily, because after takes, rook f8, knight g6, it wants to move rook b8. Now, when I was playing the game, or calculating, I should say, I simply thought he could take on f4 and go bishop c7, and it's uh-oh spaghetti, or I'm losing the queen or the rook. But I have this nice move, queen c1, bishop takes rook, queen b1 check with the classic 90-degree right triangle here, and white is actually much better after g6 and queen b8, because when black takes in this position, now you can go queen to a7, if queen e8, knight e3, bishop e6, and queen a3, material is even, but you have an outside pawn here. And additionally, the, this bishop on e6 is very passive, trying to guard the pawns on d5 and c4. So this would be very good for white, but I'm already getting low on time. I'm already starting to feel very nervous about the situation, and I play this move rook b1 instead, and this is simply a mistake. Now, the reason I played rook b1 is I thought the only way to try and keep the advantage is to keep rooks on the board, try to use the two b's, try to attack somehow, and get an advantage. But now Abbasov plays queen d7, targeting the pawn on g4, and I play the move g5. Here he goes bishop g4, and now I'm very unhappy, because somewhere around this point in the game, most of the moves that I was calculating and playing, his responses were coming as a complete surprise. So when I played g5, I expect him to play bishop f5 here, but then he blitzes out bishop g4, and after I go queen g3 and h5, I'm starting to get really nervous, because now I'm down to 11 minutes, I have no obvious plan, Pawn on c3 is under attack. He can go rook e8 and knight f5 to infiltrate on the e file. And I'm starting to worry about the chances that I might even lose the game. So I play queen e3. We got knight g6. Now I go bishop to h2 here. We have rook e8, and I play the move queen d2. Now, computer actually wants rook to b8 here. But again, at this point in the game, I don't want to exchange the rooks here because I feel like only black can be better with this massive pressure on the pawn on c3 after a move like queen e6 because I just don't know how I'm going to guard my pawn chain. So instead, I play queen d2. At this point, I'm trying to move quickly because I don't want to get down to one or two minutes on the clock because then the chance of a blunder before move 40 increase exponentially. So game continues with rook e2. I play the check, king h7, and now I go queen to c1. And here, Abasov blunders with the move queen e7. Now, it's worth pointing out here that Abasov was way up on the clock here, but he makes a quick move, and it is a mistake in this position. Now, I was actually very worried about the position here if he plays the move bishop c7, because black has the classic kebab on the second rank, and it's feeling very, very dastardly. I can trade and maybe go rook to a8 here, but after queen e7 with rook e1 incoming, it's very, very hard to judge what is going on. And with the time situation especially, I was very, very concerned about my prospects. But Abasov plays this move queen to e7, and now I hit him with this nice wooden shield, bishop e5. Now, bishop e5 is an excellent move because, first of all, I create the classic wooden shield in the middle of the board, which cuts off the coordination between the queen and the rook. Black's knight on g6 is already pinned as well, so at this point, black's in a lot of trouble. Now, Abbasov spent a lot of time here looking for a satisfactory solution. At the end of the day, he plays move queen e6. Now, the computer wants this weird move, bishop c3, because after I take takes queen c3 and queen g5 apparently with black having two pawns for the horse it's still very much a game but i think in human practice this is a move that almost nobody would play because it simply looks like you're losing a bishop for a couple of pawns so abyssal plays queen e6 but now i can start to breathe a sigh of relief because we're on move number 37 i only have to make three moves in five minutes and the next couple of moves are pretty straightforward i play knight g3 trapping the rook on e2 now keep in mind i had a feeling here i had an easier way to win but when you're really low on time with only a couple of moves to go you're looking for a safety net where you have the advantage but there's also zero risk of missing some kind of tactic and losing the game so i go knight g3 targeting the rook or trapping the rook i should say on e2 abyssal sacks the rook with rook takes bishop i take he takes and now i play at rook b5 abyssal takes on c3 and now I play my 41st move, which is queen to e3 here. And now the dust starts to settle. The queens have to be traded because if you move away, you lose the bishop on c3. 
So the queens come off the board and now Abasov plays d4. I trade and I go king f1. Now, one of the interesting things here is the computer does not give white a huge advantage here. It actually thinks it's very small. But during the game, I thought I was already winning because of the dead horse on g6. Now, what do I mean by a dead horse? This horse on g6 is going to be pinned for eternity. I'll give you a sample line. Let's say black was bishop b2 here. I play something like, um, let's say I go... Um, Rook to c5, we get c3 here, and now I can play this move rook to a5. Or actually, sorry, wrong order, sorry. I play something like um, knight to e2 here, black with c3, and now I can play this move knight to d4, cutting off the bishop from moving to e6. If black goes king g8, now I can play rook to b8, king h7, and now I can start to slowly improve my position here because black simply is running out of moves. After bishop c1 and rook a8, pressuring the pawn, Black cannot activate this knight as it's pinned for the rest of the game. Now, it's weird because the computer is actually giving white only a small edge, but I assume this is due to low depth, frankly. Um, let me, sh I guess I'll leave it as is. Probably due to low depth, but at this point, black can't ever move the knight. If you ever go f6, for example, um, probably here, I can move even move my knight to b5, go after the pawns on c3 and a3, and this knight is just a huge issue because of the pin. Now, again, I'm using the weak engine, so it's probably giving the evaluations a little bit lower than it should be, especially because I haven't looked a little bit uh, on site after the game. I know that this was very, very good for white. But the point in this position as we get back to the game is that this knight on g6 being passive means that black really is struggling to try and save the game. So Abasov plays h4, I go knight to e2. Now apparently knight f5 is a little bit better potentially, but I play knight to e2. Here Abasov plays bishop e3, and now things start to fall apart. Abasov still could have played bishop b2, creating his own wooden shield on b2 with the idea of c3, but after knight to f4, let's say black goes c3, and now move like rook b4. Black is in all kinds of trouble here with this massive pin, threats towards the bishop and the pawn on this diagonal, and computer already says that white is winning. So Abasov plays bishop e3, but now I go rook a5. And the reason I play rook a5 here is I want to win this pawn on a3 and start pushing p. If I can start pushing this a pawn up the board, I assume that black will simply not be able to stop the pawn with the two b's and the lack of a horse being active. So Abasov goes king g8 here. Now I make, now I take the pawn. He takes. I make the check. He blocks, and I go a4. Now it's amazing that the computer is not saying this is completely winning. So already here, I thought with the outside pawn just pushing p up the board and the knight being pinned on the back rank, I assume this is already very close to winning. And I think my opponent Abasov also thought the same thing, which is why he blunders with this move f5. Now apparently, the computer thinks after bishop e3, it's still a game. I thought after a5, g5, something like a6, I was close to winning say king g7 and something like bishop e4 and apparently after 96 the show goes on which is kind of hard to believe honestly as i look at this position but apparently black is still very much in the game now of course both myself and my opponent we thought that it was already very close to over his body language was not positive i also thought that i was completely winning with this a pawn going off the board but the computer being a 3500 level player shows how difficult it is to play such positions so after a4, Abasov goes f5, trying to bring the king to the center of the board right away. But now I play the move knight to d4, pressuring the pawn on f5, and he goes h3. We swap the juicers, and I go king f2, he checks, and now I go king f3, he checked, and I go king g2. Now basically the reason I'm winning here is because the pawn on f5 is falling, but I can still also just keep pushing p with this a pawn going up the board. Abasov plays f4, and now I find the very precise move bishop to f5 here, trying to get rid of one of these bishops. Abasov checks, and now I go king f1, and he has to trade the bishops. If he plays bishop f6, which is another move, I can take, take, and I can play this knight's check on e6. The knight is pinned, and after king h7, rook takes f8, I win the game. So Abasov, trade, Abasov here decides to trade the bishops. Sorry, he plays bishop takes f5. I take, he goes bishop g5. And now after this move a5, Abasov resigns the game as I'm just going to be pushing p, turning this pawn into a queen and winning the game. One sample line, which is very beautiful, is let's say black plays g6 here. I can sack the rook with rook takes knight, king takes, and now I go a6 because this e3 square is covered, so you can't stop the pawn from queening. And after he takes knight, I push p, I get a queen, and the queen will win against the bishop and three pawns. Now, Abasov probably saw this along with a plethora of other ideas, which is why he resigned, but it would have been really nice to be able to sack the rook and win the game. But at any rate, he resigns here, and we get a very, very important win in the 10th round of the FIDE Candidates Tournament. So, 
A huge win, a very topsy-turvy game. Much like yesterday, I was not very happy with my time usage at critical moments in the game. But we do get the win. I am now a half point out of the lead. The two leaders, Yana Pomerci and Di Gukesh, drew their individual game. The two Americans, myself and Fabiana Caruana, we both got wins. So America is back, baby. We're both half a point out of the lead. We both will be playing Gukesh and Nepo in the final four rounds. So hopefully one of us can get through and win the tournament. But at any rate, speaking for myself at least, a very, very big win, and we're back in contention if I can find a way to win another game or two in this event. So, on that note, tomorrow will be a rest day, of course. It's, I believe, the second to last rest day after the 10th round. Of course, it is also Tuesday, which means I will be getting back to my regular job as a professional streamer and will be competing in Title Tuesday. So make sure to watch my kick stream to see me compete against the best players in the world. Maybe even a certain Magnus Carlson if he chooses to play. But at any rate, that's it for now with the candidates. So I get the win in the 10th round. Tomorrow's rest day. I'll stream, of course, and I'll see you guys very, very soon. So last but not least, if you guys are not already subscribed to my channel, make sure that you smash that subscribe button below, and we'll be back with a recap after round number 11 when I play against, I believe, Pragnanta. It could be a good catch, but I think it's Pragnanta first, and we'll see how it goes. So I'll see you guys soon. Hope you enjoyed the recap. Have a great rest of your day. Bye!